going to be in Romans chapter 13. You'll be finding that in your Bible today. Romans, the 13th chapter. Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to get back into the Gospel of Mark. But I've just been bringing some message having to do with the season, holiday season, also the season of the new year. And, um, and so that'll be the case this morning and this evening. In this passage in Romans, we're going to look at, and uh, it's just a, it's a part of this general epistle that Paul wrote to the Romans, but it's sort of a section that, like many of the sections in this, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 14, it's just a general admonition, challenge, and charge that applies to them, but also applies to us. We're going to begin reading in verse 11, and I'd invite you, if you're able to stand, to stand with us for the reading of the scripture, Romans chapter 13, and please direct your attention to verse 11. And I just want to encourage you, I, I, I see folks looking at their Bible, that if you don't bring your Bible to church, to bring your Bible to church and look at the words of God because it's the words of God that matter a lot more than just what we think or believe or our opinions. And so verse 11, Paul writes and says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness. Wantonness is another word for just excess and, and just uh, living uh, very undisciplined lives. Not in wantonness, not in strife and envying. Verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Now, in a general way, Paul was writing to the Romans and telling them to be conscious of the hour in which they lived. That phrase in, in verse uh, 11 there, knowing the time, mattered to them. He said, you need to know what time it is. He's not talking about the time of the day, the day of the year, but he's talking in a general sense. As a matter of fact, the, there's two references in verse 11 to time, knowing the time that now it is high time. And this maybe seem like a minor detail, but the first word there, time, is translated from the word Greek word karios, which means a season of time. Not a specific time, but a season of time. Knowing the season of time that you live in. The second word time in verse 11, when he says it's high time, is the word aura, H-O-R-A, like our hour. It means a moment of fixed in time. Knowing the general time you live in, he says, it's, time, it's high time. It's a specific time to wake out of your sleep. It's like a fixed time. And I've heard this so many times in my life, and you haven't. I've done it. Saying, you know, what time is it? Do you know what time it is? And so we're going to, this morning, we're going to consider this matter of being conscious of the time. The more conscious we are of what time it is, the more we act. You know, my wife and I were watching the clock this morning, knowing what time we had to leave the house to get here on time. And she had some rice that was cooking, and we left it uncooked. You know why? Because we knew we had to leave to get here on time. When you know what time it is, you act sometimes differently, right? You act accordingly. So we're going to think about this subject today, knowing the time. And let's pray as we begin. Father, thank you for your word today. I ask you to bless as we study it. Help us to give our attention to the words that you have for us in the Bible. Lord, help us to receive it with meekness, that it might 
save our lives, save our souls, that it might make our lives profitable for you. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So Paul says it's not time for sleeping. It's not time for napping. It's time to wake up. That's what he's saying in verse 11 there. It is high time to awake out of sleep. We need to be alert. We need to be awakened. You know, um, hypothetically speaking, this would never happen, of course, but hypothetically speaking, this is someone, let's say someone who worked all night, they come to church, they've been up for eight hours plus driving time, they come to church, they're tired, and they have a hard time staying awake. No one had ever had a hard time staying awake in church, of course. But these people had a hard time staying awake. Well, you'd understand it, you know. They, they've, been, they've been awake for so long that they, their body wants to get some sleep. But let's imagine someone who just comes to church regularly knowing good, full well that probably they're going to get a nap while they're in church. Um, they're not going to get... And they're comfortable at that. They're comfortable being asleep in church. Well, Paul's not talking about physically sleeping. He's talking about spiritually sleeping. And sometimes we get comfortable just sleeping spiritually. These, this, this admonition was not written to lost people. It was written to save people. You need to wake up. You need to be shaken from your sleep. And a lot of people get that way. They get very comfortable just going through the motions not taking their spiritual life seriously. And so Paul says we need to know the time. You know, time, time is really a precious commodity. And I believe that the older a person gets, the more they recognize the value of their time because they have less time to live, less time to influence others, less, less times to be with their family. Time is the stuff life is made out of. We call them minutes, we call them hours, we call them days, we have increments of time, but it's all a matter of time. And in, in our generation, it's, there's no doubt, in our generation, we have more time consciousness, may not realize it, than previous generations. We have alarms set for everything, right? T time to get up in the morning, you know, time to do this, time to do that. I set me alarm today. Be sure and get out of church by 1 o'clock. We set these alarms. We, set, we have all these reminders. And we live by schedules. And it's frustrating to me. It's frustrating sometimes when people don't take time seriously. I'll, I'll never forget the first time that I traveled to Mexico. And I found this, what I'm about to say, true in a number of other countries. But particularly uh, Latin American countries. And that is... When you announce in Mexico that church starts at 11, you know when, what that means to them? It means, basically, we'll get there eventually. And it's, it's not uncommon you don't start till 11.20 or 11.30 because people just keep dragging in. And you could say, well, let's announce the time at 10.30. We well, go ahead, but they're not going to be dragging in until 10.45 or 11 o'clock. And it's kind of, I found that very frustrating because I, I have an American mind but in a sense, this is what Paul is writing about, a carelessness concerning the time. Time awareness should be important to us. I'm talking about a spiritual thing. And the new year, obviously, to me, provides a great opportunity for us to evaluate the stewardship of our time, how we spend our time, the time we have with our families, the time that we have reading our Bible, and seeking the Lord. And we all say here that, well, I just didn't have time to do that. No, we do have time to do it. We're just not being good stewards of our time. We have time for, you know, searching the Internet. We have time for checking out our Facebook feed. We have time for doing this. But what, what about our time spent for seeking the Lord? What about, what about time to serve the Lord? If you looked at your life in 2020 and evaluated it, would you say, I think I served the Lord with as much time as he would have me to serve? Or would you have to say, honestly, I didn't have much time in my schedule for serving the Lord. Well, now's the time to rethink some of those things. The time that we have 
And I'm talking about as a person now who's, you know, past 65, 66 now. The time that we have, every day that we have is a gift from God. Amen. It is a gift from God. But what we do with that time is our gift back to God. You've given me time. And I'm going to use the time you give me in a way that would be pleasing to you. So Romans 13 in verse 11, Paul says, knowing the time. And again, he's not talking about checking your watch and seeing what time it is. He's not, he's not talking about a calendar. He's talking about the stewardship of our time, using our time wisely. He's talking about being aware of what time it is. Time doesn't stand still. You know, in 2020, many things were disrupted. Many of our routines were changed. But we still had the same amount of time. But how did we use that time? And honestly, I think if we're not careful, we, we get into this mode of saying, well, I can't do this and I can't do this, so we don't use our time wisely. He's talking about using, our, there's an urgency that comes with knowing what time it is. There, there are three basic lessons in our text that I want us to consider together today. And the first one is verse 11 where he says this, knowing the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. This was a wake up call. But it wasn't a wake up call from Paul. This was a wake up call from God. It's time to wake up. Do you think people can sleep spiritually? Do you think people can just be in a place where they're not really aware of what's going on? They're not, they're not conscious of what's going on? Paul is pressing on these Romans the urgency of using their time. And why should they? Look in verse 11. He says, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, he's not talking about being converted. When he used the word salvation there, he's not talking about being saved, being born again, being converted. He's talking about our salvation being complete. You know, our spirit, he's talking to saved people. Our spirit is saved. Our soul is being transformed. But the final part of our salvation is when we leave this earth. When we're called to be with the Lord, our salvation will be complete when we leave this planet, either by death or by the, the rapture of believers. And he's talking about the end of time. Knowing what time it is, our salvation is closer than it's ever been. And it is closer than it's ever been. He says in verse 12, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. The time for sleeping is over, Paul says. The night is far spent. You know, I looked up in several dictionaries and got a variety of d definitions about what sleep is. You say, well, you'd think you'd know what it is. I do know what it is, and I like it. But it's, a lot of things happen when you're sleeping. And one thing, there's a change in your brain activity. And you enter into this place of rest. One definition says this. Listen about this definition and think about it on a spiritual level. Sleep is a state of inactivity with a loss of consciousness and a decrease in responsiveness to events taking place. That's what sleep is, and that's what sleeping spiritually is. It's, it's losing consciousness of what really matters. It's, it's having a lack of response to things that are going on around us. It's time to wake up, Paul says, because that's where people are. These, the people, you know, I don't know a lot about these Roman believers except I know what Paul said to them. And this is one thing Paul said to them, wake up. It's not time for sleeping spiritually. It's time to wake up. And I, I think today, if we'd be honest, sometimes we, you know, we are being sluggered spiritually when we need to wake up. And, and I, I can only come to this conclusion. If it was time, when Paul wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, if there was an urgency about waking up, saying it's later than it's ever been, how much more should we recognize the importance of waking up? Ask yourself this question this morning about the urgency of the time that you have. Now again... You know what it's like. Maybe you, 
never experienced this, but I have. You know, when you set the alarm, you got to get up by a certain time to go to work. And you either hit the snooze button or the sloth button, whatever you want to call it. You hit the snooze button and you go back to sleep, but you accidentally hit the off button and you wake up all of a sudden with a jolt and you're already but late. You know, you, you know what that feels like? How many of you can actually identify with that? Many of us can. There, you, with, all of a sudden, you're just, you're just jolted with the fact that there's no time to waste. I've got to get ready. I've got to get out the door. That's what Paul says. You need to wake up and realize it's later than it's ever been. And honestly, I think sometimes spiritually, we can't relate to that because we don't see it the way the Word of God presents it to us. And sometimes we need a wake-up call. Sometimes a wake-up call in a person's life comes when there's a, some tragedy, unfortunately. And I know people who've been awakened spiritually because of a tragedy. Something happened in their family, something happened in their world, and it just all of a sudden they realize, I've been wasting my time. And I'm not going to ask you to acknowledge this today, but if, so, if we'd be really honest, we'd have to admit sometimes, I've been wasting my time as far as my spiritual life, as far as my obligation to serve God. I've been wasting my time. And that's really what Paul is telling the Romans. Our salvation is nearer than it's ever been. I know this. And I mention it from time to time. And, and I think you would agree with this. If everyone in this room really believed that Jesus would come back by this time next week, it would greatly alter the way we live this week. I know it would. But you know why we don't? Because we're not aware of the time. We don't take our time seriously. And that's why Paul is admonishing these Romans to wake up. Our salvation is nearer than it's ever been. We need to wake up to responsibilities. I'm not going to turn to it, but Paul wrote a similar thing to the Corinthian church. He said this, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and stop sinning for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says, you're living in a world where people don't know the Lord and you're asleep. Wake up. Wake up. Quit living in sin and, and fulfill your obligation. I think about parents today. What if, what if we had children that profess to be saved? And they're old enough that they could serve the Lord with their life, but they're not serving the Lord. How should we as parents feel about that? I'll tell you, we ought to wake up, and we ought to wake them up. But what about adults who've been saved for a period of time, and they're not actively serving the Lord in any meaningful way? You say, well, don't you believe it's God's will for children of His to not serve the Lord? I don't think it's God's will for any child of God not to serve the Lord. It's just not. But you know what? We're asleep. We're asleep. We're not really awake to what's going on. Paul said it's time to wake up. He said it's time to wake up. And look what he says in verse 12. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let's cast off. Get, let's get these things out of our life. Everything associated with darkness. And darkness doesn't just mean when the sun goes down. Darkness is the old man. Darkness is sinful living. Darkness is living for self. Cast that off. Get it out of your life. And he says, put on the armor of light. Put on the new man. I have two men living inside of me. One of them's the old man. It's carnal, selfish, prideful. One is the new man. It's humble. It's obedient to God. It's holy. He says, cast off the old man and put on the new man. And, and he goes on and says in verse 13, and walk honestly as in the day. And he lists things. Not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, 
not in strife and envy. Get that stuff out of your life. Walk, he says. Walk honestly as in the day. We're to live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Not, as, not like the world. Get, he says, get that worldliness out of your mentality. Live like a follower of Christ. And how does that mean? That means our priorities are affected. That means our service to God, our activities, our leisure, our entertainment, our idle time. Don't live in carnality. Don't live in sin. Don't live in worldliness. Don't be spiritually lazy. Don't be slothful. Don't live in strife. He mentions strife and arguing. And then he makes this statement in verse 14, which to me is the really the height of this passage, verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be yielded to God. We're to be filled with the Spirit of God. Teenager, let me ask you something. If I were to come to you today right now and just say to you, in the last 48 hours, can you honestly say for the most part of the 48 hours I've been walking filled with the Spirit of God? You say, you really believe teenagers ought to be filled with the Spirit? Absolutely. If they're saved, they should be. But what about adults? We sometimes, here's what we do sometimes. We get up, we go through the motions. We just, we just take life as it comes to us. We're not seeking the Lord. We're not asking Him to lead us. We're not yielded to Him. We're not surrendered to Him. We're just kind of going through the motions. You know what that is? That's like sleepwalking. Unconscious to spiritual reality. And Paul is saying, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The goal is to be an imitator of Christ. Think about these words from John the Beloved in his first epistle. He that saith, and that would be most of the people in this room, he that saith, he abideth in him. He that saith, he abides in Christ, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. You say, preacher, do you think that we should try to imitate Jesus in our life every day? Every day that ought to be our goal. Every day we should be seeking to imitate the Lord, to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And many people in this room, and I'm not saying this to be boastful about anybody, but many people in this room, that's how they live their life. At their job, with their family, in every way possible, we're trying to be as much like Jesus as we can. But that ought to be all of us. If we're saved, our members of our body should be yielded to Christ. We're to be like him. And then notice he concludes this passage in verse 14 where he says, And make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust there. No, make no provision to the flesh. We're not to give any place to the flesh in our thinking, in our decisions, in our actions. You know, everybody's going to sin from time to time. The people that we think are the greatest Christians, the strongest Christians, the most sincere Christians, I'm part, I tell you, there are people that are serious about their walk with God, but everybody's going to sin occasionally. It's just it's a part of the life that we live and the flesh that we have and the human nature that we still struggle with. But people who live carnally as a routine... They do so because they, they do not take this passage seriously that says make no provision to the flesh. We live carnally because we yield to lust and we yield to the flesh and we live carnally because we, we don't take our spiritual life seriously. I was reading some passages yesterday in the book of Proverbs. In the book of Proverbs speaks numerous times about the love of sleep and how that the love of sleep is associated with laziness and slothfulness. And, and, it's, and, it, and it's depicted in, in Proverbs as a lifestyle choice, being spiritually lazy. The folding of the hands to sleep, you know, just... And by the way, I... The older I get, the more I appreciate a good night's sleep. Sometimes it comes, doesn't come often enough. But laziness, staying in bed, saying, well, there's, there's a lion in the street. It's dangerous out there. I'm just going to stay home. 
I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to be active. There, there, there are certain dangers out there. That's associated with slothfulness and laziness. And Paul, Paul, that's what Paul's saying. Let's wake up. You know, I think the new year is a great time to have a wake-up call. Especially this year. Because so many disciplines and so many structures and so many things that were a part of our life, many people... They've, it's been disrupted and we get into that routine of not, of not making ourselves wake up and be serious about our spiritual life. I read an interesting thing yesterday from a nationwide respected uh, survey company. And I'm thankful this is not true of our church, but it says that across America, on the average, one out of one out of five people who were attending church regularly before this pandemic are no longer attending church. That's shocking, isn't it? Now, I'm, I'm just saying this to the glory of God. I don't know of a person in our church that was attending church regularly who's not still attending church. Now, they may not be attending a church as regularly, but I've heard from people in our church even saying that this this kind of lull in service has affected them in a negative way. And I think now would be a good time for a wake-up call to say let's not allow ourselves, just not give ourselves this, this uh, opportunity to say, well, we're just not going to be as serious about our spiritual life as we should. This is, an urge, this is calling for urgency about our time. You know, Again, I may be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. This is my honest evaluation or personal observation. I think I've heard more from people, individuals, people in our church, people that I know, preachers, sermons I've heard, things I see on social media. I think I've heard more in 2020 about how close we must be to the coming of the Lord than I've ever heard in my life. Have you seen that? Even people you work with and people you're around saying, you know, it really looks like something is about to happen. It looks like we're coming in. And I believe that. I really believe that. But if that's true, how is it affecting the way we live? Paul says knowing it's later than it's ever been. Let's wake up. Let's wake up and get serious. Or, you know, knowing the time. What, what time is it? You know, this passage, as I said earlier, is a charge to believers that knowing we're closer than ever to the coming of the Lord, we need to wake up. This is not new. This kind of charge, this kind of in-your-face challenge is so common in the Bible. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples once, John chapter 4, I mean, he was very direct to them. Don't say it's four months and then comes the harvest. He said, look on the fields. They're white already to harvest. What are you doing talking about one of these days? What about right now? There's a job to be done today. There's ministry to be done now. Brother Hawkins preached last Sunday evening from the book of Acts. And when Paul was standing before Felix and had this opportunity to give the gospel to Felix. And the Bible says when Felix heard it, he trembled. It affected him. It impacted him. He took it seriously. And this is what Felix said. Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll come to you. He said, I, he knew it. He knew God was ringing his bell. He knew God was speaking to him. But he said, go thy way for this time. I'm not interested in doing it now. That's the danger of not taking our time seriously. Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, Redeeming the time. Be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming means to buy back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something clear, I think, today to all of us today. There's no way we can get back the time that we wasted. If you wasted time this week, if you did things with your time this week, that kept you from doing the things that God wanted you to do, you can't, you can't get that time back. But we can make decisions about how we're going to spend our time going forward. 
We're going to redeem the time. We're going to make our time useful. Are we going to be better stewards of our time? Now is the only time we have. The writer of Psalms referred to this in the 90th Psalm when he said this. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You know, it's wise to be aware of the time. Now, we have a calendar. I have a calendar on my phone. I have a calendar on my computer. I have a calendar on my tablet. My wife has a calendar on her phone, a calendar on her tablet, her iPad. But she keeps an old-fashioned calendar, the kind you flip the pages over. (laughs) She likes that the best. So the other morning, I guess it was on the 1st, she had it out and she's writing days on that calendar. And you know what? It's wise to number your days. It's foolish to go a week or two weeks and three weeks and not think about what I've done. What have I done for the Lord? You know, I don't know how the Romans accepted this. This was an epistle, it was a letter written to a local congregation from the Apostle Paul, a word from God, wake up. I wonder how many people took it serious. I wonder how many said, this is a wake-up call from God. You need to wake up. You need to be serious. Our, Our days are getting away from us. After a lot of consideration and praying and thinking about it, I decided I'm going to make this our theme for the year. Knowing the time. Every year we have a theme. And that theme, like our last theme, stand, it affects, it it has a way of kind of infiltrating our thinking and make us apply the word of God. We need to we need to know what time it is. And if and you I promise you, and many and probably some of you will do this. You could hear this sermon. It's not my opinion, it's what God says. It's time to wake up. It's later than it's ever been. You can walk out of this room and say, well, I'm, I'm going to do that one of these days. You missed the whole point. Now, is to, knowing the time, we ought to change the way we're thinking now. We'll be looking at that throughout the year. But I was thinking this morning, actually, about one of the most critical times in the history of Israel. It was during the days that Ahasuerus was the king of Persia and the Persians were the world power that replaced the Babylonians and an evil man by the name of Haman who was high up in the king's court. He hated the Jews because Mordecai would not bow down and recognize Haman. And through a conspiracy, Haman got King Ahasuerus To make a decree. Think about this. That every Jew in the kingdom would be killed. There was, by the providence of God, one of Haman's, or Mordecai's relatives was Esther. And Esther had been promoted as the queen. The queen of Persia under Ahasuerus. The thing is, nobody knew that she was a Jew, but she was. Mordecai knew it. The decree's been made that all the Jews in the kingdom will be killed. And Mordecai sent the queen a message and asked her to go to the king. And he said, and you're, many of you are familiar with this, she, even she said, she said, I can't, nobody can go before the king unless they're invited And if you stand to go in and he doesn't invite you, it could be a death sentence. And this is the words that I want to mention that Mordecai said to the queen. Who knows? Who knows? If you hadn't come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your time to make a difference. This is your time. And you know what? She said, you fast and pray and I'll pray and I'm going to go before the king and the rest is history. God worked miraculously. You know, none of us today know how much time we have left. 
But we know this, you ought to know this, that one day our life on this earth will end. And, and the rewards that we find in eternity are going to depend upon the wise choices we make in this life concerning our time. I can't control how long I'm going to live, but I can control how I'm going to use the time I have. And maybe nobody in this room needs this. Maybe none of us need a wake-up call. Maybe none of us need to change the way we look at life and look at time. But I know I am. I know I need it. I need to be reminded because one of these days, how things go, in et- I'm not talking about whether you go to heaven or not. I'm talking about whether you're going to be rewarded and your place in the kingdom and the ability to serve. All those things are affected by how you live your life right now, today. I read an interesting quote from Robert Moffat. Moffat was a pastor and then a missionary, a pioneer missionary in Africa back in the 1800s. He said this about use of time. He says, we'll have all eternity to celebrate our victories. Isn't that a great statement? We'll have all eternity to celebrate our victories. But the rest of the sentence says this, but only one short hour before sunset to win them. We'll have forever to celebrate our victories, but we have a brief moment to win those victories. So how would you today, on this first Sunday of the new year, how would you describe your state of consciousness, of spirituality? Paul says, cast off spiritual darkness. Everything associated with carnality, everything that has to do with easy choices and a lack of discipline, a lack of alertness, laziness, cast it off. And put on the armor of light. We're in a battle. Put on the armor of light. Light has to do with godliness and holiness and obedience to Christ. And that would be a good way to start the year. Throw off our sins and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it starts with salvation. If you're here today and you're not saved, I prayed for you this week. Not by name. Many others have prayed for you. That you would take your spiritual life seriously. Come to Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in Him. You ought to do that today. And if you're saved, we ought to say, I need to wake up and start taking my spiritual life my dedication to God, my heartfelt worship, taking it seriously. You say, preacher, do you really believe that it matters how sincere we are in our worship and our service? Absolutely, it matters to God. It matters to God. doesn't just look on what we do. God doesn't just look down at this building and say, Thomas Smith showed up today. Everything's good. No, God looks at our heart. And it's glad, we're glad we're here, but it's more than that. It's our heart. Are we worshiping God in our heart? Wake up. What a great admonition today. For the new year, let's have a wake-up call. Let's let's take God's word seriously and say, I'm going to begin to cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we, we brought, I just thought about this, we brought um, Tracy and Bryson in with us because their car wasn't responding today. <laughs> needs, to be, needs a wake-up call. So as they got in the car and we headed down the road, I said to my wife, now let's not argue and stuff like we normally do on the way to church. <laughs> I was being facetious, of course. But you know, the truth is a lot of times... We allow things and do things and act in ways that we know aren't pleasing to God. We need to wake up and take this life seriously because who knows, we may be on the threshold of eternity today. Amen? Let's bow our heads together for prayer. Knowing the time 
knowing that we're closer than we've ever been to eternity. Let's wake up. Right where you sit today, just between you and God, could you just say, Lord, I want to, I want to take this wake-up call seriously. Not just a wake-up call from the pastor, but a wake-up call from God. I want to take this seriously. Knowing the time, it's high time we awake out of sleep. And if you're not saved today, can I just beseech you, implore you today to come to Christ? I'm going to be standing here at the front. If you need someone to talk with, pray with, help you with that, you ought to come. If you recognize, you realize you have a concern about your soul, I don't really know that I'm saved. I have doubts about it. You ought to come. Our Father, we thank you today for the words in the Bible that challenge us to consider our use of time, our stewardship of time. Father, it's easy for us just to drift off into sleep spiritually. Not being conscious, not being aware, not being concerned about what's going on in life and what our purpose here is. God, I pray that you'd do for us what no preacher could do. And that is to cause us, as we talked about earlier, just have a, a wake-up call to get more serious about our journey, our spiritual life, our families, our responsibility, our stewardship. We'll thank you for that.